So good morning. So um, Jay, Emin, and I were asked to look into the future. Uh, and to understand the future, you have to understand your past. So my perspective is going to be heavily influenced by my past. So clinical training, inflammatory bowel disease, inflammation, immunology, and most recently, uh, biobanks. So uh, just a little bit of history. So genetics in the last 10 to 20 years um, have been dominated by the GWAS paradigm. Uh, the case control paradigm has been triumphant. Um, and it's worked really well because chips work really well in common variant scale well. Uh, some of the obvious successes are the presence of uncommon loss of function protective alleles, which have gone directly to direct drug targeting highly successfully in, in many examples. Uh, work from John and many others have pioneered the idea that you have enrichment of the GWAS loci within cell-specific enhancers. Biology acts fundamentally by the cells, and so identifying what the critical cells are that drive particular complex traits um, I think is a critical first, obvious first step. Uh, Jay touched on this briefly, and again, we can talk about this more in the discussion period. Um, really, it's incredibly exciting, uh, the application of these polygenic risk scores for clinical prediction. Uh, how fast is this gonna be uh, integrated into clinical care? Um, I think it's gonna be empirically answered, but I think it's incredibly promising. Um, and again, to really emphasize this point, I think you know the big bold idea: biology acts by the cells, and we're really in the, in the just the beginnings of a revolution of our understanding to our ability to uh, analyze and intervene at the single cell level, which I, I think is really the the big bold idea uh, moving forward. Um, just a couple of limitations of case control paradigm and where we need to, to move. Again, Jay touched on this. Um, there are major discrepancies in all complex traits almost universally with the dominance of European ancestry populations. Um, I'm not sure that NHGRI or NIH necessarily has to be the major uh, solutions for this. Uh, this may be self-resolving to a great extent. Um, there are large uh, kind of population cohorts that are being driven and developing in both Far East Asia as well as uh, South Asia. But again, I think we have to be very cognizant of where uh, the U.S. can play a particular role in driving new collections uh, for non-European populations. Um, and again, this will be a, a major topic of this workshop, and, and we're doing this in inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD, um, is where in this common to rare continuum the sweet spots will be for various uh, diseases with various uh, genetic architectures. Um, in IBD, we're just in the process of, as you get to, to more complex chips, more sequencing, uh, really, it, I think it's an unanswered question. Um, as to how important and substantial these Goldilocks alleles, if you just arbitrarily define it a particular allele frequency of 0.5 to 5% in the IBD field, uh, how much of those are to be discovered with higher effect sizes but larger contributions to variants in terms of how impactful they will be in terms of understanding the biology at a cellular level. And a final point is, you know, there is a drive to scaling things and understanding everything for all variants that contribute to all diseases. But again, I, I do think we should prioritize, and Jay touched on this very briefly. In the IBD field in Crohn's disease, you have a fundamentally different architecture in European ancestry Crohn's for the major risk alleles, NOD2, IL-23R. In Far East Asian Crohn's disease, we have a completely different genetic architecture, dominant effects of a completely different locus. And these are the major effect variants, and we don't really even understand completely the biology for how you have such a fundamentally different genetic architecture between Europeans and Far East Asians. And so I do think we should prioritize and try to understand the biology of the major effect alleles um, in the various different traits. I agree with, uh, with Jay that really we can't, uh, absol we can't forget about model, model organisms. They're a critical part uh, for uh, in the armamentarium of them. Uh, uh, I maybe would have a slightly different emphasis, though, than, than Jay, and that I'm primarily a human investigator. Um, and again, uh, we have to balance different relevance. I think they should be assessed in the context of the relevance to humans in terms of the speed, your capacity to do studies in different organisms uh, need to be kind of uh, context dependent. Um, and clearly, as we want to, if, if the goal, if one of our goals is, is, is drug development, uh, really a critical aspect of the developing specific therapeutic hypotheses uh, are going to be required prior to any human-based uh, testing of novel agents. Um, and so specific therapeutic hypotheses specific to the model organisms um, needs to be done. Um, I think as we look at all of the uh, kind of 
primarily protein coding, but also eventually non-coding, is that as we compare sequence annotation across species, this is going to provide enormous insight into our capacity to more deeply annotate the sequence and systematically understand the functional consequences of this of this of uh, genetic variation. And again, I think that um, there's, you know, we don't want to get into a um, uh, kind of a, an arguing about the value of flies versus, uh, uh, you know, murine, but I think there, there really needs to be a systemic and transparent discussion of similarities and differences. When are model organisms helpful? When are they not helpful? Um, I think it needs to be done. Um, so I, I see everything through the lens of inflammatory bowel disease or IBD. Um, and so just a few kind of points. When we think about human disease and traits, uh, you want to understand its disease prevalence, its incidence, the peak age of onset. And I think it's telling us something very fundamental about the biology that we still don't understand. So just one subtle difference. Uh, IBD, the peak age of onset is 15 to 30, kind of post-pubertal and young adults. And I just kind of realized this versus type 1 diabetes. I'm on the external advisory committee for the TEDI project. And they actually, their, their peak age of onset is, is primarily prepubertal. So once you start hitting puberty, the incidence of type 1 diabetes goes down. I think this is, again, telling us something very fundamental about biology um, that we, we really still don't understand. Uh, another factor is that IBD, even though its phenotype is dominated by intestinal inflammation, you very commonly have systemic complications. And so when we think about how to assay the biology of this, I think a fundamental aspect of understanding the genetics of inflammatory bowel disease involves direct ex vivo sampling of tissues, and we can do that because the gut is very accessible, but so too is the blood. So it's much easier to, to regularly sample the blood uh, as well as the tissue to understand the impact uh, of these genetic variants. Uh, the other factor that I think it's important as an ex-clinician, I no longer practice, but it's, it's clearly true. When you start trying to predict outcomes, uh, you really do have to be quite honest that the quality of clinical care profoundly affects outcomes. Whether you do or don't respond to the major therapies for inflammatory bowel disease is profoundly uh, impacted by whether you started at the right dose and early enough. And so again, some very practical clinical factors are going to profoundly affect um, outcomes of interest. And the final point um, is that IBD-specific antibodies can be detectable in the blood years before the patients actually present with disease. Um, so the abnormalities in the immune functions annotate over disease by years. Um, so where do we want to be with those kind of backdrops? Where do we want to be in, in uh, 10 years in inflammatory bowel disease? And so I think that uh, one of the things that continually shocks and kind of disappoints me a little bit, is that when you look at clinical care, the, the standard of blood tests that you get early on is pretty similar to the standard of tests that I, I ordered in medical school 30 years ago. And so I really think there's an enormous amount of progress that can be done in terms of improving biomarkers in blood routinely for efficient screening in at-risk populations. Um, I've not really been pushing early genetic testing in inflammatory bowel disease because, again, it's one of these, as opposed to cancer, where the earlier the better, you take out the cancer. In inflammatory bowel disease, um, it's less obvious that you're going to institute the major therapies unless patients manifest disease. But again, I think one of the things that we want to think about as we think about polygenic risk scores, and we think about those Mendelian forms of inflammatory bowel disease that don't respond to traditional therapies, um, you, you really do want to think systematically about earlier upfront genetic testing. Um, and so it, here's where I might disagree just a touch with what Jay said is that um, Testing in mouse models is not that straightforward. So the first Mendelian form of inflammatory bowel disease was published in Cell in 1993, uh, knockout to the IL-10 pathway. And this was uh, 10 years later. There were actually Mendelian forms identified in humans of autosomal recessive knockout to the IL-10 pathway coincident with the mouse model. But it's less clear, it's not obvious um, how these Mendelian single gene forms of, of in model organisms necessarily inform treatments or inform the actual biology or the more common forms of inflammatory bowel disease. And so again, even in the case of Crohn's where we have a dominant allele like NOD2, that has not yet been combined with other risk alleles that actually that can phenocopy human disease consistently. So again, we have to be aware of some of the limitations of this. 
And again, as a general factor, especially in Crohn's disease, we're pushing for earlier intervention once a patient is diagnosed to improve long-term outcomes. And so one of the major, most exciting uh, developments in the IBD field, we've been focusing on the immune cells, but what's really evolved more recently is that those stromal cells, those, those cells that we ignored and tried to get rid of in our cell cultures, um, are actually the fibroblasts, the stromal cells, may be crucial in terms of understanding pre-disease and progressive factors and cells that contribute um, to the phenotype. So um, from that IBD example, um, how can we then scale this uh, across human traits? And so again, I'm a big believer in direct ex vivo sampling. Uh, we can't solve human disease in plastic, uh, plastic wells. And so you really must, must learn to kind of sample in cases where you can. It's not possible in all diseases, uh, both blood and tissue. And again, that's going to raise all kinds of challenges of rigor and reproducibility. Uh, because you're obviously the tissues are evolving with time and with disease um, inter, um, development. Um, I think what's crucial, and again, an area that I think is not necessarily going to be phenocopied well by animals necessarily, um, are time course considerations. Many of the most crucial developments of disease uh, will involve the process of understanding of normal and diseased aging and development. Um, and again, it, when we think about some of the major kind of uh, uh, health factors that we need to address, um, this, I think the, the aging process is crucial. Um, the other factor as we go to the single cell revolution is understanding the cell-cell communications. Okay? So a cell is going to act differently. It's going to respond transcriptionally differently in response to the cell-cell interactions, um, heterogeneous and homotypic that are going to occur. Another kind of area of opportunity um, in NHGRI is the understanding that it's not just in cancer that you have clonal expansions. I think a very exciting development has been the understanding that somatic mutations play a crucial role in a number of non-cancer disease. And again, it can't be stated highly enough. And again, this is why in the IBD field, we're focusing so much on direct ex vivo sampling, is the context is king. You have organ-specific uh, considerations, um, as well as understanding uh, stem cell regeneration and injury. So a heavy um, cancer uh, immunology bias. So again, uh, we focus a lot on DNA and RNA, but uh, biology acts not only by the cells, but also by protein. So exciting new technologies for scaling protein analysis with hashing uh, to scale as effectively. Again, Im immunology and immune system in neurodegeneration. Um, and again, uh, the value of immunology is when you think about the cells that constantly repopulate the tissues, their immune cells coming from the bone marrow. A couple of comments about biobanks. Uh, so I spent the last three years um, um, directing the biobank at Mount Sinai. Many opportunities, opportunities for machine learning uh, in radiology and pathology. Uh, a major factor that I think is a really easy win is that with all the great genetic discovery over the last 10 years, we know which genes are important. We know which genes confer major effects. And so instead of going from phenotype to genotype, uh, going from genotype to phenotype backwards. So of all the um, APOL1 carriers or all the, the various uh, mutations of interest, given a mutation, what's the phenotype in an unbiased manner in a health system? So these are very nice uh, projects. Another area that I've learned in biobanking is the value of natural language processing. Uh, this greatly improves sensitivity and specificity over the traditional ICD codes. Uh, Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease are not NAFLD uh, versus steatosis on our radiology report. The latter is much more powerful, much more sensitive and specific for the phenotype of interest. And again, the biobanks offer an opportunity to make a progress under study diseases. So like uh, we have a, um, a kidney investi investigator, Garish Nakardney, in our institute. Just when I did a, geno a search on genome-wide association studies in chronic kidney disease, vastly understudied uh, compared to its impact in the population. And then finally, by sampling randomly, these biobanks are great for biomarker development for late onset disease or neurodegeneration. So last slide, uh, suggested directions to consistently achieve breakthroughs. We don't, we want to make, we want to have a balanced portfolio. You don't want to just make incremental advances, but you do want to impact patients. And I think the most single most valuable thing would be rapid resourcing of multidisciplinary teams, classic geneticists plus biology plus domain expertise. Um, in the single cell revolution, making big data accessible to biologists rapidly in ways they can understand and interact with. Um, 
I think there's a great opportunity for training. A 10-year plan must think about training, um, inspiring students about the math of biology and genetics substantially. So understand the unifying principles of scales as opposed to just specific gene names and facts. Um, Heidi will talk more about uh, integration to healthcare now. It's happening whether we want to or not. And I think this has great opportunities for, for reinvigorating the physician researcher. And finally, kind of, I, this is the goal of the next couple of days, is creating cumulative value, prioritizing the scope of the problem, creating teams, multi-participatory teams to solve them, and then scaling across traits. So thank you.